is really loud. This is better. Guys at the back, are you okay? Hear me okay? Cool. Uh, well, seeing as uh, we've got the keynote happening here right afterwards, so I'm going to try and start promptly and uh, not to hold up the keynote. And uh, well, I hope you all enjoy the conference so far. I think it's been great having so many different people from different backgrounds coming together, talking about the use of functional programming <coughs> in the real world. And uh, yeah, just bear with me for one more hour before you can uh, hear the keynote and then go to have the inevitable beer after conference you're going to have. For this talk, we're going to have a look at the use of F-Sharp in the real-world production games that we are running right today. And uh, these are games that are being played by, actively played by millions of users. So it's, 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 high, it's fairly high-scale applications that we have in, the, uh, in production for a couple of years now. My name is Yan Chui, and I often go by the online alias of the Burning Monk because I'm a big fan of Rage Against the Machine. They were and probably still are. If they're together today, the best band ever. I work for a company called Gamesys. We are based in the central London. And uh, whilst Gamesys is known more as a, a very successful company in the real money gaming business, my team, however, we focus on a different target audience. So I build back end, a back end for games that are targeted for Facebook and a mobile. So the, typical, the, the kind of games you typically find on those platforms. And of, uh, across our games today, we have around a million daily active users. So these are unique, the number of unique users that come into our games and play every single day. And between them, they generate somewhere around 250, uh, 250 million requests per day. And pretty much anything you do in the game is recorded and analyzed. And for that, we track somewhere between two to three terabytes of data every month just for analytics, which doesn't take into account the amount of data that we actually generate in order to facilitate your gameplay. And for that, our data for the play game states, our database is regularly received somewhere up to about 25,000 requests per second. So for this kind of system, you, ask, you may ask uh, why use F Sharp? When F Sharp, well, for now at least, uh, it's been used most heavily in the finance space. But on its own, it's actually a very versatile language. It's got loads of very nice language features and design, well, designs uh, that allows the, makes it a, a very good choice for a number of different workloads. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to uh, use our games, uh, in, well, our use of F-sharp in production games to illustrate how F-sharp can help you with uh, productivity and getting your product into the market very quickly without sacrificing on quality as well as correctness of your application. And how you can use F-sharp to build systems that run efficiently and solve complex problems with very simple solutions. Hopefully you enjoy the session, and at the end, uh, you might consider coming to an f -Sharp Exchange conference, a one-day f -Sharp only conference that we have in London on the 17th of May. It'd be great, sorry, April. It'd be great to see you there. So some sh there's a sh uh, shameless uh, self-marketing aside. Uh, the biggest use of uh, f, f -Sharp in our solution right now is in the implementation of a slots engine that runs all of our social slots. If you haven't played a social uh, a slots game before, uh, it's actually very simple. You got pay lines that you can win on, how much you're wagering, the number of lines you're betting on, and when you press the spin button, you make a web request, and the server comes back telling you whether or not you want anything based on the symbols that land on a particular pay line, or if you've got special symbols that give you a win when you have X number of them scattered anywhere on the screen. The slots engine, you need to implement a math model that comes from our mathematicians and is responsible for determining uh, what symbol lands after the call, as well as, and therefore your likelihood of winning from, your, from this action. And also needs to implement the actual payout model that tells you how much, that determines how much you get paid. Every game has got some slightly different features. So in this particular game, for instance, we need to remember your average wager since the last time you went into a bonus game. So the next time you go into a bonus game, that can be your uh, wager for that bonus game, for that bonus round. Also, uh, if any of you play the, the, the classic Monopoly game, you'll be familiar with the notion of houses that you can place on a board, as well as railroad cards and utility, uh, utility companies. So when you, play, when you do a spin, we randomly award you with these tokens that you can then take into the bonus game. And to model, uh, to model this game, we need to decide what the model, the, well, what a symbol looks like. If you've seen the enum in C Sharp or Java, this, uh, this is what we call discrete union in the F Sharp. You can think of it as a, a enum, but a powered, up, a powered up version where each enum clause can be associated with an arbitrary tuple of types. So in this case, we're saying that a symbol in this game can either be a standard symbol, which is described by a string, or it can be a wow symbol. Uh, but unlike enums, which is just a facade over numeric values, 
discrete unions, there are, there are full on types, and it's not possible for you to create invalid discrete union types that has not been defined here, like you can do with enums. And in order to instantiate a standard symbol, for instance, we need to supply it with a string, which uh, gives you some descriptive name for the symbol, and the while is just what it says on the tin. We can apply the same technique to model our the different ways you can win. So for a line win, for instance, we need to know the pay line number you run on, what symbol and how many. And similarly for a scatter win, we need to know the symbol and the count. One thing I don't like about this way of modeling is that I've got integers everywhere. Uh, whilst they suffice in terms of my data needs, ultimately a count is the integer, but it doesn't allow me to surface my domain through my types, through my model. My domain here is modeling a slot. It's, it's all about pay lines, it's about symbols, it's about whatnot, but it's not about integer values. So what you can do is create type aliases, which is in a way allows you to surface your domain through the types that you use to model your domain. It also gives you better encapsulation as well, so if later on you change your mind to you want to use the unsigned integer instead of int, you have one place to do that. And, you don't have, and by doing this, you don't have to change any of the code that's, that's making use of your discriminant union types either. And since there's no nouns in F-sharp, so we don't have to worry about those, and you can get rid of all the boilerplate code that you typically have in order to deal with uh, invalid states. Which is a very powerful concept you can have. And uh, in the late 90s, uh, NASA famously, or rather infamously, crashed one of its Mars orbiters into the, the moon, because one of the engineers thought the float was measured in miles rather than kilometers, because clearly the guy is from England, is British. Uh, as innocent a mistake as it may be, it cost NASA $125 million with a simple mistake like that, which just goes to show that even though this guy must be crazy smart to work for a company, what, well, organization like NASA, human errors is still very much a fact of life. So we need all the help we can to prevent us from making errors like this, which thankfully in F-sharp, we have uh, this notion of a unit of measure which you can use to add contextual information to numeric values that we use. So in this case, we are defining a, a unit, a special unit called pens. And to do that, we need to decorate our type with the measure attribute. And the great thing about unit measure is that it also handles combination of units correctly. So for instance, 10 meters divided by two seconds give you five meters per second. Or 10 meters times by 10 meters give you 100 meters square. But if you try to com uh, you combine different, well, com incompatible units together, like we're doing here, then you actually get a compiler error. Or if for some reason someone for, uh, pass an um, uh, integer value by, diff by mistake into a, fun into a function that uh, does, does calculation on the uh, meter, meter values, you also get a compiler error. So this helps you eliminate a whole class of human errors that you, can of you often find in other languages. So the use of unit measure gives us a much stronger static guarantees in our code. And again, it helps us prevent the uh, invalid states from creeping in. So here we're using, uh, well, using discriminant unions and unit measure to help us model the different payouts that we can have in our game. And again, using type alias to, give, to make our code more readable and give more meaning to code, well, to types that depend on, this, uh, or depend on them. And this is the F-sharp record. Uh, if you haven't seen the record before, it's just, it's just a very simple lightweight data container type where the fields are immutable by default. So back into the game, here you can see on the screen the player's average wager as well as the, the, the line that he, he won the spin on. He won the 700 coins on line 17. And if he keeps on spinning, eventually he's going to get three bonus symbols on the screen that triggers a bonus game. And he will get the chance to use the collectible that he's picked up so far, like in the classic Monopoly game where you can place the houses that you picked up on housing spaces, you can choose uh, which railroad stations to own, and so on. And to represent all, every single of these spaces on the board, we can again use a discriminated union. So for railroad, we need to know whether or not it's, uh, this particular railroad space is owned by the player, and the same goes to the utility companies. And for housing spaces, we need to know how many houses the player has placed on this particular space, which determines the, the bonus that he's going to get in the bonus game round. And for the entire board, we have a, record, a very simple record that just contains the, um, the spaces in an array, 
But notice at the bottom here, we have a custom indexer, which gives you easy access to the space by using an index value. But we don't want people to accidentally pass in, say, a count or a multiplier into this function because that just wouldn't make any sense. So again, we're making use of unit of measure to make sure that whenever you're looking for a space on a board, you're, using the, you're sending us the correct value to do that. So that's once you place your board, this is what the uh, bonus game looks like, where you've got a mini slot at the top. Uh, every time you roll the dice, you get to get a spin on the mini slot for free as well. And uh, when Mr. Monopoly, or also that will move Mr. Monopoly around the board. And when he lands on the go to jail space, or if you roll three doubles in a row, then it's game over, unless you've picked up some uh, get out of jail free card at the top left there from one of the mini games you play when you get one of the chance or community chess cards. So to capture all the information we see on that screen, we have another very simple record. First, we need to know the average wager that you have picked up from your base game that's taken you into the bonus game, as well as the total win that you have accumulated so far. Again, those are using uh, the pence unit that we defined earlier. And we also need to know Mr. Monopoly's uh, current position on the board, as well as the board itself. And when he lands on one of these uh, chance or community chess card uh, space, then you get to play this mini game, which may give you a random bonus in coins, or you get the get out of jail free card, which uh, when you hit one of the game over conditions and you've got one of these uh, get out of jail free card available, then it's not game over. You consume one of these cards, but then you get to keep playing the bonus game. So again, we have another special unit called the live here. Uh, Mr. Monopoly start the game uh, on the goal space, which is index zero. And the uh, Joe space is six spaces from there. And if Mr. Monopoly goes to the, well, lands on the go to jail space, space, then he'll get moved to the go to jail space. So here we have a function called move, which takes in Mr. Monopoly's uh, new position after a dice roll as well as the player's current state. We can fetch the space that Mr. Monopoly ends on, well, ended, landed on, and use the pattern matching with the match with keyword to see, okay, if Mr. Monopoly ends on the go to jail space, there are two cases we need to consider here. If there's no more lives left, then uh, we're gonna have to move Mr. Mon Mon uh, Monopoly and then it's game over. Otherwise, we only have to move him. And notice what we're doing here is that we're making a recursive call to move and every sharp, every recursive well, a function have to be explicitly declared to be recursive, just to prevent you from accidentally making a function recursive and end up recursively, well, infinite recursion. Another thing to know is that the order of this, uh, these cases matter, so you need to handle the more specialized cases first. But thankfully, the compiler gives you a hand here if you ever get this wrong. So if, I, if these two lines was, was, uh, was uh, moved around, the compiler will work out that, okay, because you're handling a more general case here, that specialized case will never be hit, and you get compiler warning, so you can then go back and fix it. And similarly, when Mr. Monopoly lands on the house or railroad or utility uh, space that uh, you own, so we need to give you some multiplier, we need to handle them, handle them here, and notice we're only handling the positive cases here. All other cases will then be captured by a catch-all clause later on. Again, play mini games, uh, 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 mini games for chance and community chess card. So this is how everything looks. Even though there's quite a number of different conditions here, but when you look at this code, it's quite, you're almost looking at like a table where on the left-hand side, you've got your conditions. On the right-hand side, you've got what to do under those conditions. So in terms of communication with a game designer or someone else, you can even just take the things that they put down in the, in the spreadsheet somewhere and quite literally translate it to code that you can use. And that's the casual case that we have down there where, okay, there's nothing interesting we need to do with the state, so just return the state as you gave it, gave it to us. Any questions about this so far? Great. Actually, I forgot to ask, uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with F Sharp or one of the ML languages? Uh, okay, quite a few of you. Nice to see. Um, well, this is the Lambda conference, I guess. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, so this was actually one of the more, most complex games the, uh, the company has ever made, but it was, deliver was delivered on time, it performed really well, and uh, the zero defect reported, and f part of that I think is because we use F-sharp, so go F-sharp. 
So to quickly recap, discriminant unions and records give you a very lightweight and this, uh, lightweight syntax for creating types as well as hierarchies. And it lets, it lets you very clearly, concisely model your domain and model and express your domain and help prevent invalid states from being creeped in because you basically make invalid states unrepresentable in your model. And in terms of application logic, pattern matching as well as uh, pattern matching gives you a very clear and concise way of expressing all your different all your branching uh, conditions and you need a measure to give you a, a strong way, well, another way to enforce correctness of behavior in your application. And compared to an existing Java solution that we had in the company for the real money side of the business, using the use of F-sharp gave us a, at least an order of magnitude increase in productivity. So on the real money side of the business, we have games, uh, we have engines that does the same, serve the same, uh, same purpose, but we have a whole team of Java developers maintaining that, and it takes them sometimes days to implement a very simple game. And with the F-sharp solution, we had at most one full-time F-sharp developer in the last couple of years, and uh, he was able, then, you know, we were able to produce a game from any, anything down from a, a couple of hours compared to a couple of days which is very important for us because uh, as a, as a, well, even though we have so many players, we have actually a very small team of uh, backend developers behind every, all of the projects and everyone is responsible for from in terms of uh, design, implementation, releases, as well as monitoring everything that's happening in production. So we have to make, every, make sure that every developer is enabled to do the work that, as the, the best he can and be productive. Another place where f came in very handy is in the implementation of a stateful server architecture that we had for our MMORPG game called the Hibi Monsters, where the game has tons of content. It's got something around, uh, well, more than 500 different locations in the game. It's, uh, you know, it's a game based on the real world, real world where you can travel around, you can pick up things. There's about 2,000 uh, 2, quests you can do in the game and about 8,000 items. And one of the side effects of having a game with so much content is that the players like the hot things and they have this massive gigantic states that can grow into several t uh, megabytes. Which means that the stateless model becomes uh, well, inefficient and doesn't really make sense in this case, especially when you consider that we have a one-to-one -one read to write ratio. Anything you do in the game modifies your state in some way and that, modify, uh, then, then that change needs to be remembered. So using the stateless model, even though we were using you know, very good scalable key value store databases already, it doesn't really help us because the, the size of the, the, the state as well as the number of writes we see means that we now have a very expensive cluster of machines for, to, in order to st store the player state, but especially when you take into account the need for replication as well in case one of the nodes go down. And also when you have large states, serialization becomes a really a heavy bottleneck from the benchmarks I've done in the past, I can see that in some games, where the state becomes you know, quite big, you will see somewhere, somewhere upwards of 95% of CPU being spent on serialization. Even when we're using you know, good serialization uh, protocols, such as protocol buffer, uh, 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 we still see a very high percentage of CPU being spent on serialization. But when you consider that the player activity is actually quite bursty, like most web traffic that you see, a stateful approach would cut down your number of database calls very significantly, as well as reducing the, the, the cost that you have associated with, uh, state, uh, with serialization. And also, it means that we can fall back to S3, which is much cheaper, uh, uh, much cheaper to operate, and uh, is very, actually very good for big, uh, big objects as well. And it also has supports for auto versioning as well as auto archiving to Glacier, which is even cheaper solution that Amazon provides for you to have uh, um, you know, historical data that you don't need to keep any can it keep anymore. So the approach we've taken is to uh, to, uh, to adopt the active model, which is something that f -sharp supports uh, natively, uh, native, natively, and something that uh, Ricardo actually has talked about quite in a lot of detail in his talk uh, previously, and. Um, the active model, is everyone familiar with the active model? Should I go into it? Okay, anyone want to hear about the active model some more? Okay, we just skip, because a lot of people have talked about active model at this conference so far, because we've got a lot of Erlang guys, we've got Elixir guys, we've got f -sharp guys talking about active model. So uh, let's just move on. Oops. So we didn't act to everything, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, everything executes synchronously, so it's inherently stress safe. And uh, the last line that how Huey used to describe an active model there, just describes a st simple state machine. And in our particular solution, we have two types of uh, state machines, one for managing a list of uh, local workers for each player, 
as well as spawning a new worker when a new player comes onto the server. Another one to another, well, a worker, a state machine is responsible for managing the state for a particular player, as well as uh, using optimistic locking to deal with concurrent requests from the same player. And after a player has gone idle for a little while, we then need to go and save his state into S3. So as a simple example here, worker B and worker C are currently live on a server, and, and player A makes a request. The gatekeeper will get the request and see, okay, we don't have a worker for this guy, so let's spawn a new worker. As part of his initialization, the worker A will go to S3 and fetch the player's current state. And then he will respond to the calling code directly without having to go through the gatekeeper again. Because in this particular setup, the gatekeeper is your risk in terms of a bottleneck. So you want, to, you want to limit the number of messages that have to go through the gatekeeper. And worker, in the meantime, the worker B sees that, okay, my player has been idle for a while, so now I'll go and save his state into S3. So uh, provided that, providing that uh, no request from the player comes in while I'm doing this, because saving to S3 on a big file could take a little while from a couple of seconds to maybe even tens of seconds. So pr provided that the player doesn't come back in the meantime, and that my persistence was successful, the worker would then tell the gatekeeper that, hey, I'm done, and then he's going to switch to a closed state and then shut himself down. So the next time the player comes back, the gatekeeper he will see, okay, I don't have a worker for this guy, so I'll tell the player that, hey, go find yourself another server to talk to. In this case, the, ser the player would then go back to the load balancer, find himself another server to communicate with from that point on. So this way allows us to stop a, player, a particular player from hogging the machines, and we help distribute the load uh, across our cluster. So in terms of implementation, the, the, the implementation of active model that comes with F-sharp is called the mailbox processor. But for some reason, the convention in the, in the F-sharp community is to use the type alias of agent. I don't know why that is exactly. My theory is that the first documentation for the use of mailbox processor did this, so everybody who's ever used the mailbox processor ever since has uh, adopted the same convention. So actors can communicate to each other via messaging only, and we can define a type to, to tell you what type of messages can be passed between the, the, between the workers. And for each one of these messages, we need to have a reply channel so that we can, so when you send us a message, we know, how to, we know where to send the, message, the reply to. And we need to decide uh, what type of information can be sent back. So first of all, we need to, tell, we need to know whether or not the operation was successful, and if it failed, what, why did it fail? So we have a generic result type here that just a, that's a container for the successful case as well as the failure case. And unit, if you haven't seen it before, it just means void in the C sharp. So that completes our type definition for a message that a worker can receive. And for the worker itself, well, it needs to know the player's unique ID, uh, which amongst other things allows you, to know, allows you to know where to save the state to in S3 or where else. And you can use the start method, uh, start method to start a, uh, well, an actor who can, who can accept messages of that particular type that we just defined earlier. So here we have two states that, the, that the, this particular actor can be in, either working or closed state, and they're both defined as uh, recursive functions. So note that the, the use of let and end here, this, allows these two, this makes these two functions mutually recursive, which means that they can both self-recurse as well as call each other. Otherwise, the order, of, uh, the order in which the functions are defined means that uh, the closed function won't be able to call the working function. And when we first start the actor, it's going to go and fetch the player state from S3 and then go into a working state with the, current, with the state that it's got from S3 as a version 1. And then in the working state, it's going to asynchronously wait for messages to arrive and then deal with it. So inside this block, this is called async, async workflow in F-sharp, inside this async block, we can perform asynchronous operations and then asynchronously wait for the response. And if the operation has any return value, we can bind that return value using the let bang keyword at the top. But if the asynchronous operation has no return value, then we can use do bang instead. So this allows us to write a non-blocking I/O code uh, without well, non-blocking I/O code as if it's right, we are writing synchronous code, which uh, reads much easier compared to a callback-based um, uh, approach. 
And this is very similar to C sharp, the single way keywords, but it's been around in F sharp since 2007. And the C sharp version is actually, actually very heavily influenced by the design of the F sharp async workflow. Another thing to note that is that we're actually using try receive with, with uh, 60,000. So here we are looking for, we're waiting for messages to arrive for up to 60 seconds. If nothing, and this particular call returns the option type, which is either some message that we received or none. And if uh, 60 seconds has passed, we didn't get anything back. So that call will actually return none, in which case we know it's our cue to go and persist the player state and then recurse, well, and then go into the closed state. On the other hand, if we receive a message to fetch one of the player state, then we reply with the current state and version that we have, and then we recurse with the same state and version. But if someone is trying to save a state, though, so for optimistic concurrency, we need to check in the, put mes in, the, uh, in the message, does the version match the current version that we know about? If in this case, if it does, then we say, okay, you are so good, and then we recurse and increment the version that we know about by one, so if another, if another request comes in for some reason in the meantime, and we're gonna see, okay, well, for every other case, that means the version did not match what we have, therefore we respond with the error of the exception, uh, version mismatch with the information about the current version that we have and the version that the, the caller has passed in. So those are the four different cases we need to handle in the working state. In the closed state, it's much simpler. We are basically just saying, whatever you're asking me, I don't care because uh, I'm, I'm not working anymore. And this is how all the code fits together. Uh, the one thing to note here is that we are actually having two functions, two, met uh, two methods down here. This is so that we hide the use of um, a mailbox processor as an implementation detail and does not surface that to our caller. With this, with this approach, we found a 500% improvement in, in, the, uh, in efficiency, meaning the same server can handle five times as many concurrent calls as previously, and the latency, average latency is dropped by as much as 60%, which is even more significant uh, when it comes to the tail latency. I don't remember the exact number now, but with the, with the stateful approach, we can handle well, we can handle it much better. So even when we push the server to 90, 100% CPU, we still get a pretty good tail latency number versus the, the previous, uh, the sales approach. And the, one of the big wins is that we don't have to run database nodes, well, we don't have to run the key value stores anymore, we, and we can use S3 instead, which is much cheaper. And all in all, we cut our operational costs down by more than 90%. But there are some trade-offs with this approach. For starters, we need to make sure that the request for the same player gets routed to the same server for as long as that player is assigned to that particular server. And since we can't use the load balancer to distribute load anymore, we have to do that ourselves. So using the mechanism I described earlier where if the player comes back and his state has been saved, we tell the players to go and find another machine. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that sessions, they vary they vary in length as well as activity. So some players may come in, do a few things, have a cup of tea, come back, do something else. Other players may come in and have a marathon session with 10 hours long. I think the longest time we've seen for the for first day user is about 13 hours. So someone just came in, got hooked on the game straight away and just, just went crazy for 13 hours straight um, without so much as a break for more than five, 10 minutes. And most importantly, we need to avoid having hotspots in our, in our cluster so that some machine will be overloaded and everyone who's on that machine, who stays on that machine, gets a terrible experience because latency goes up while other machines are being uh, underutilized. So in practice, we found that a good strategy for handling that is just to have a relatively short idle wait uh, inactivity timeout so that if a player hasn't done anything for say about a minute, then we go and save his state. This allowed the, 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 the nodes in our cluster to be fairly well balanced in terms of both CPU as well as uh, the number of active players on that particular node. And finally, we need to make sure that we still have a mechanism for gracefully um, shut, down a, well, shut down a node without losing state because uh, bec there is uh, about 4x uh, difference between the, the peak and the trough of our, of our traffic, so we don't want to be running the same number of nodes all the way across, so we need to have a way to be able to scale down, which is just as important to have a way to scale our, our cluster up. And when we scale down, we don't want to lose any player state um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a process, as, as part of that process. So to recap, 
Using F# -sharp's agents, we can write uh, number, we can write concurrent code without any locks using message passing. And one of the big advantages for the actor model for me is that um, every 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 actor itself contains and implements a very explicit protocol. And because of the, they tend to be easier to reason with, and because you also tend to have uh, fewer code in that particular actor, make it easier to look at that code and see that there's obviously no there's no obviously, obviously no error there. But it's still a very low level construct and uh, by default any unhandled exceptions in your actor will kill your actor in using the FGI implementation and there are some built-in uh, mechanisms for doing supervision and then what not but they are quite primitive and that's just in the, in the, in the case of FGI mailbox processor there's no distribution at all it means that for any two actors to talk to each other they have to be on the same box whilst well, you can build some of these mechanisms yourself but before you do that, you should actually look at some other available resources that has that exists in today, which uh, um, Ricardo talked about uh, Aka.net, and uh, there's also Microsoft Orleans and Cricket, which is the FSHA library for doing that. But if you're not, on, and if you're more adventurous, uh, you can also go into the Erlang space where you have Erlang, Elixir, as well as uh, list flavored Erlang, uh, which are all running on the on top of the Erlang VM. Has very high, uh, where we have a also you have a very good uh, distribution about well, distribution and concurrent uh, uh, concurrency story there, and using uh, asynchronous workflows you can really easily write uh, non-blocking IO code with uh, F# -sharp async uh, async workflow that ends up looking very similar to the sort of synchronous code you will write that make it very easy to to look at and understand and without using using callbacks. And also, again, we saw how the use of pattern matching allows us to express our application logic very clearly and easily and uh, handle all our branching logic. So the last case we're going to look at is the use of uh, discriminant unions uh, as a replacement for large class hierarchies. And we're going to stay with hybrid monsters, where in this game, we also have a quest and achievement system where you can tie into everything the player can do in the game. So for instance, if you, if you call a gnome, you tell the player to go, uh, no, go catch some monster, he call a gnome, he's going to get some uh, experience, uh, some items, some gold as reward, as well as meeting any requirement for a quest to go catch a gnome in the, I know, London. And when you get experience points, you're gonna potentially level up or meet other require quest requirements. And when you meet the last requirement for a particular quest, you finish, you complete that quest. And again, completing a quest will unlock any follow-up quest, uh, as well as giving you more experience item and gold, as well as, no, as well as meeting some other quest that says, okay, you have to go help uh, Ricardo do this thing first, which is a separate quest, and then go help uh, 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 someone else to do something else. <laughs> And when you level up, you also get items and gold as well as unlock any level locked quest as well. And everything also gets fed into the achievement system, which is just as devious in terms of the potential knock-on effects it can have. And when you complete the achievement, everything happens again. So you can just go round and round and round for a long time. But uh, by, by design, by the game design data, that doesn't happen. So you, you don't just end up doing one thing and then 100,000 things happen and you finish the game. Hooray. Um, that doesn't happen and it wouldn't be a very interesting game if it did. Uh, so this system we have is actually quite good for the game designer to give them loads of different tools to play around with to make interesting quests and uh, achievements for the players to go and do. But for me, it was quite challenging because part of the trial of difficulty is that we have so many different actions that uh, every action can give you, most actions can give you some kind of reward, which again, when we saw that earlier, there's a huge knock-on effect that needs to be handled there. And uh, we need to do all of this, uh, handle all the knock-on effects as part of our request handling code before we report back to the player the delta in their state. And all, of the, all these events are triggered by different abstraction layers that are you know, handling specific aspects of the game logic. Could be leveling up or fishing or catching a monster or traveling or you know, going to a bush and get some fruit. As well as meeting any non-functional requirements we have such as um, Analytics tracking, everything you do in the game has to be recorded and, and uh, analyzed, as well as third party reporting for ad partners. So if you came to the game via, I don't know, Facebook ads or some other ad partners like uh, Nanagans, we need to report back to them when you reach certain milestones, like, okay, you reach level three or you complete the tutorial quest, so then they can then use that data to optimize, to help optimize their targeting algorithm and in turn give us better players, uh, more profitable players as well. So the solution that we ended up with uh, was to have to was inspired by the message broker pattern, which is of course 
and, and uh, I guess application level is architecture level pattern, but we just applied it at the lower level. And every, whenever something ha interesting happened in the game, we call that a fact and we put that into a request specific queue, which each one of them gets processed by a number of different processes that uh, may or may not care about this particular type of fact. And they can then in turn feed more quests or well, more facts into the queue that has to be processed. And so on. Everything we're doing here, you can do that with a complex event processing system. But the difference with our case is that the scope for the and the scope and purpose of the events are much more focused, are much more limited. It's just affecting this particular request for this particular player. And for us, this is really a mechanism for linearizing otherwise spaghetti, you know, program control flow that we have in the code. And with this solution, we actually found that, uh, well, we found that uh, it's, uh, it's actually quite easy for us to, there's very little uh, overhead in terms of performance, implementation, as well as maintenance. But the downside being that we needed lots of facts. Considering there's so many different actions you can do, we need a fact for every single one of those actions, as well as all possible state changes that can happen your, to your state. So you're easily looking at a class hierarchy with hundreds of classes. I imagine if your boss comes to, to you tomorrow and say, Hey, and how are you doing? How are you doing today? And then ask you to go and write 200 classes. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but I'll probably rage quit, it, I'll rage quit at that point. So instead, we decided to do that with um, uh, discrete union as well. But there's a problem here. Discrete unions are great, but you doesn't, it, it doesn't work when you have hundreds of different uh, variant class, uh, variant types. So you need to break this up somehow. And ideally, this is how I would do it, where I have a different type of discrete unions uh, that cover different aspects of the game. And then I unify them all with a top level discrete union. And in order to process them, I just again use pattern matching, and off we go. But there's a problem with this approach as well, because uh, it doesn't play so well with C sharp. And most of our code base is still in C sharp. And uh, in C sharp, if you want to create a new discrete, uh, discrete union, this is the kind of code you have to write, which is not easy to read. And it gets a lot worse by the time you have a few layers of uh, discrete unions and a lot of arguments that need to pass in. So the compromise we found was to use a marker interface to mark our discrete union types. So now we don't need a top level discrete uh, union type anymore. Uh, we can distinguish the different subtypes by using type, cast, uh, type testing instead, which is what uh, this uh, real looking symbol does. This is saying that giving, the, uh, giving a fact is of the type state change, in which case uh, we can cast it and capture state, uh, uh, a variable of that particular type into a variable there, and we can pass it into a more specialized uh, code that deals with that particular type of change. Um, this solution was easy to was really easy to implement as well as easy to understand and maintain. And uh, it's easy. And if you want to change the arguments that you have for a particular fact, or add new facts, or have a new type of fact, it's also quite easy to do as well. And whenever you do that, you're gonna break some code somewhere. But thankfully, it's a compiled, it's a static language, so you get the, it's a compiled language, so you get the compilers to tell you where to go and fix your code. And it probably saved me day, well, saved me at least days and potentially weeks and months in terms of uh, the time I have to spend to, uh, to manage and maintain the, that particular code. And with that, uh, thank you very much for listening. I think we have five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we have five minutes for questions. So anyone, okay, yeah. Partially for cost saving, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, what database setup were you using before, and why was it expensive? It was couch based. It was expensive mostly because the states are so big. If you imagine, even even though it's quite scalable, you need at least say a couple of nodes for replication, and taking into account that every write and every read is uh, several megabytes of data passed back and back and back and forth. So even if we have a relatively small number of concurrent users, we are running three. Uh, I can't remember what size nodes, 
but all in all, it adds up to a uh, couple, couple hundred dollars even at the early stage of the game. So as we see the game grows and getting more and more users, we, you can just project the cost start to go up that way as well. And uh, so S, and whereas S3 is, is very cheap and we don't need any queryability in this, in this case because all we need is very simple key lookup and S3 is very good for large objects as well. And like I said, it also supports auto versioning. Every time you save a new version, you can, uh, you can turn on your bucket and create a new version for you instead. And when that version is, say, three days old, it gets archived to Glacier, which is a fraction of the cost of S3 for those historical data. So the cost is a, was a big factor in that decision. Any other questions? Okay, if no question, then, well, if you think of anything else, you can also contact me afterwards. And uh, for anyone who's interested, we're hiring as well. And uh, in our team, we get to work with some very interesting stuff, including F Sharp, Erlang, and uh, if you're interested, we, everything we do is hosted in the cloud, so we use Amazon Web Services and Google's cloud platforms very heavily. Uh, right now, we're also experimenting with things like a Docker as well for deployment. So some interesting things to do there. And, uh, Finally, some uh, that's where you can leave some feedback. So thank you.